Let's jump into the word of God. Let's do it to it. Hallelujah. Shall we begin? First Corinthians chapter number one, verse number four. Amen. We're wearing this out in Jesus' mighty name. It's all right. I don't care. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter one, verse number four says this. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony. I love this part. The testimony concerning Christ. Come on, was confirmed in you so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Let's jump to second, the second chapter. First verse, it says this, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Watch this. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Oh, we love you, Lord. We thank you for this. So tonight, God, we pray tonight that and we're believing that you're going to move tonight in a great way that we'll have encountered with your word tonight. We thank you for the precious Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask tonight that you would open our hearts to understand, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. We'll definitely give you all the glory. And Lord, I ask tonight that you speak through my mouth, that let my mouth be used as your communication channel. Use my thoughts, use my mind. Lord, and we pray for a great anointing tonight and that this word would be confirmed with miracles, signs and wonders in Jesus mighty name. Amen and amen. Talking about the power of God. And I don't even know what number we own, but whatever. It's up there. <laughs> Bless God. Hallelujah. Um, but this is important that we talk about this because tonight is going to be a linchpin. It's going to be, a, I think, a, a lesson tonight in this idea of the testimony of God or the power of God that I think will help unlock some things in your life and help you really to receive what God is wanting to do for you. Listen, the point of this is so that we can know that God wants us to be empowered and to be powerful. You were not designed nor meant to be a weak Christian. There is no such thing in God's economy, in God's mind, as a weak Christian. Amen. Let the weak say what? I'm strong. Let the poor say I'm rich. That God has made you and designed you to exist. And he's engineered you in the spirit to exist and to function just like Jesus. And so if there was a weak Christian, that would mean that there would be a weak Christ. And we know that Christ is not weak. We know that he has risen triumphantly from the grave. We know that he is king of all. We know that he is Lord of all things, both Lord and Christ. And so this idea of a weak, limited Christian does not exist in God's mind. And you got to understand this, that we have to begin to reflect properly how God made us to be. Glory to God. Yes, Lord. And we're coming over and we're breaking down and we're casting down the lies of the devil. You know, one of the things that I'm learning that one of the biggest the, the biggest lies that the devil gives us is what it really means to be a Christian. What does it look like to be a believer? Because we have been so uh, contaminated in our understanding of what believers and Christianity looks like in America that we are afraid to identify with real Christianity. And number two, we wouldn't know it if it hit us across the head. <coughs> and so we have to, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Amen. We have to begin to become educated. We have to become enlightened and aware of this so we can walk in the fullness of what we are. You know, the biggest enemy of the Christian is not the devil. It is ignorance. The devil's a defeated foe. He is our adversary, right? So let's not get that wrong. But the biggest, the greatest enemy of the church is ignorance. It is not knowing. It is the absence of knowledge. 
because the word of God tells us not the devil destroys us for lack of, uh, not the people aren't destroyed because of the attacks of the devil, but Hosea tells us that my people are destroyed, God says, for lack of knowledge. And so because we don't have proper understanding, we don't have the, the, the knowledge that we need to exist as, uh, as the people of God. And you got to understand this is that that the, your kingdom walk will be walk will be your kingdom walk will be circumspect or it will be in lockstep with your knowledge capacity. How much do you know? I'm not talking about just Bible verses. We don't share about that on Sunday, but we're not just talking about, oh, I can quote Bible verses, but I'm talking about how much do you know for real that you apply in your life that the Lord is manifesting in you that, that you're building faith on. Right. We, we know all these facts, but these facts don't turn into truth or power that can be utilized in our lives. And so what we have to do is we have to raise our knowledge capacity so we can experience the power of God. And what the word of God is telling us, according to First Corinthians, is that the power of God is connected to your ability to walk in and to understand and to appropriate the testimony of Christ. The testimony of Christ. It's the testimony of Christ, which we understand is kingdom covenant, or we understand it is kingdom law. The testimony of Christ. This is not facts and stories. This is not just information about Jesus that needs to be confirmed in us. But what it has to be confirmed in us is this testimony, this covenant that Jesus himself has said he is the new mediator of. He is the one whose blood is, or is his blood that this new covenant is in. And so we have to be confirmed in this because it is the covenant of God. It is the new covenant that gives us the ability to one, to both be known by God and to know God. Get ahead of myself by a couple days here, but don't worry. I want you to know this, that God is a covenant God, hallelujah, and that he only allows himself to be known and he allows relationship with him explicitly by covenant, explicitly by covenant, amen. And so anything God does with humanity, with people, with any created thing, it is by covenant. You know why? Because he's sovereign, because he's king. Because he's so that much more above us, beyond us, that if we're going to properly, if we're going to have relationship with God, it has to be by covenant. Because the relationship dynamic is so imbalanced. You understand? Because he's so much God. He's so sovereign. He's so great. He's so outstanding. He's so holy. He's so awesome. And we're just so not. <laughs> he's all that. We are not. He says, you know, what is man that we're mindful, that he's mindful of us? Scripture tells us in Isaiah 55 that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are the God's ways above ours. And so there's a gap between us. And so the only way that we can have relationship with him and be known by him as he wants to is by covenant or is by this agreement, this divine agreement that he has established and it's no different and unfortunately because in the modern american church we have become so fascinated and fixated upon the event of calvary which we are grateful for and had it not been for calvary we you know would not have <laughs> remission of sin but what we have to understand that what Calvary is a picture of, it is a covenant action that Jesus himself does. Uh, the cross is great, but without the covenant, the cross's action means nothing. Jesus' death, his blameless, innocent death is amazing, and we can never repay God, and we are forever indebted to God for that. But it means absolutely nothing without the presence of a covenant to both dictate and to articulate what it is that God wants to do through this death and through his subsequent resurrection. So covenant is everything. It's the lifeblood. It's the thread of everything.
It's his covenant. It is his agreement. It is his arrangement. And so the scripture is telling us that it is the testimony of Christ or the Christ covenant, or better yet, what I've been defining as the kingdom covenant, that when it becomes confirmed in us, it will unlock and release the power of God. My brother and my sister, I want you to know this, that God desires for you to be empowered. God's plan for you is to have power, but you can only thrive in this power based upon the establishing and the confirmation of the kingdom covenant or the testimony of Christ in you. Hallelujah. It has to be confirmed to you. The apostle Paul is telling the church, listen, my prayer for you, I thank God for you. But, but, but see, he says this, I don't want you to lack in any gift. I don't want you to come up short in any area. And so therefore you need to have and to ensure that the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you. Because it will release the power of God. It will cause God's power to flow through you. It will put you on the cutting edge of favor. Oh, I love that. It will allow your faith to always be active and always be in the place to cause something to happen. Glory to God. Let me tell you something. Your success, your life as a believer is supposed to be predictable. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, that the promises of God are meant to be predictable in your life. Not only that, but the success and the prosperity and the abundance and the healing and the, and the kingdom outcomes in your life are meant to be predictable. They're not supposed to be accidents. You're not supposed to be healed by accident. You're not supposed to be financially blessed by accident. You're not supposed to have a, a, a a, a, a beautiful, loving, kingdom-based family by accident. This is supposed to be predictable because when you operate by the word of God, the Bible lets us know that his word stands forever, that it is sure that he is not a man that he should lie. Neither he is the son of man that he should repent. God wants you to know that everything I'm trying to do in your life is supposed to be on purpose and predictable. I need somebody to know this. Listen, your next million is not supposed to be by accident. It's supposed to be predictable. Hallelujah. That God wants you to know this, that, 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 that marriage that you've been dreaming of, come on, that you've been envisioning is not supposed to be by accident, but it's going to be on purpose, intentional. But that intentionality and that predictability comes by your observance and obedience to the testimony of Christ. See, and, and this is why the enemy wants to keep us ignorant towards this, because if we are ignorant towards this, then we can't walk in it. If you don't know what's yours, you can't have it. Glory to God. Come on. The kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. It is expressed and experienced by knowledge. This is why you need a preacher. The Bible says, how can they hear unless they, a preacher is sent? Come on, how can they receive or believe or receive salvation unless a preacher is sent to them? Why? Because you need knowledge. You need exposure. You need to have God revealed to you what belongs to you so that you can possess it. Thank you, Jesus. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the, th the, things, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong to us and our sons or our children forever. Meaning that knowledge is what you need, the ability to understand, to see, to know. My God, see, because when you realize that you and you know that you're not supposed to be sick, then you're going to be able to appropriate the kingdom truth and the kingdom law. And it's going to be different than just somebody preaching it to you. Somebody just telling you, touch three people and turn around five times and say, I'm going to be healed. But it's going to turn into a truth and a revelation of kingdom law based on the covenant of Christ that you can walk in. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When you know, I'm talking about when you know by truth that you can't be broke, that you can't be poor, then it will change the way you view your life. It will change the way that you in interact and you engage in society because you know why? Because you're living by a kingdom truth that you recognize belongs to you. And therefore that result, that outcome has to come into your life. I'm not saying, oh, you just want it. Oh, you're just hoping. I'm talking about, I know this belongs to me and you can't change my mind. You can't change my attitude. You can't change my confession of faith. Hallelujah. 
<laughs> I hear you. Don't you know no good? Come on now. <laughs> Bless the Lord. What you know, daddy Oh, And so the question is, knowledge becomes the goal. Knowledge becomes the objective. Knowledge becomes the way that we understand these things. Mm. Let, me, let me show you this. God is so good. Let me show you how this works in the negative. Let's jump to Romans, the book of Romans, the epistle of Romans. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to chapter number seven. I want to see how knowledge works in the natural, right? How it works according to the flesh. You ready? Watch this. Let's look at verse number seven, Romans seven and seven. It says this, what shall we say then? Is the law of Moses sin? May it never be. Watch this. He says, I would not have not, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law said, had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Huh. Now, 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 here's a very interesting point. The Apostle Paul is saying that it was knowledge of the commandments of God under the law of Moses that opened him up to experiencing an outcome of Satan, an outcome of the flesh, which was sin. He said, I would not have known about coveting if the law of Moses didn't tell me you shouldn't covet. And I read it. And when I read it, watch this, he's saying this, that then sin taking opportunity through the law of Moses, through the commandments, produced in me coveting of every kind. So here's how this works according to the flesh. It says that it's knowledge, watch this, it's knowledge, that's all I'm trying to get you to see, it's knowledge that opened up the opportunity for sin to take hold in you. Apostle Paul said, I would not have known coveting had not the law of Moses, the law of God, told me thou shalt not covet, but sin taking opportunity through the law, it produced in me coveting of every kind. Because why? Because of knowledge. Now, this is the weird inverse kind of way that the law of Moses works, which is why it's one of the reasons why it's an inferior covenant, which is one of the reasons why Jesus had to come and abolish it in his flesh. And there's another one of the reasons why that it's, we have a better covenant, a new covenant under the kingdom covenant, because the law of Moses or the law, whatever you want to call it, right, or the old covenant, no, it, when you, what's it, your awareness and your ability to pursue after it, it would, it would still cause a fleshly anti-God outcome to be established in your life. So you could say, I'm heeding the word, I'm reading the word, and it's telling me thou shalt not commit adultery. It's telling me thou shalt not murder. It's telling me to honor your mother and father. It's telling me all these different things, right? But, but notice this is that he says that because sin had a backdoor pass. So whatever law of God and truth, while I'm under this covenant, I knew sin had the opportunity to cause that very thing to be manifested in me. So here I am reading all this knowledge, getting all this knowledge about how to love God with all my heart. Here I am with this knowledge saying, you know, uh, uh, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Here I am with all this knowledge that's saying, you know, to honor your mother and father. But, but sin, had a weird collaborative 
effort with the law of Moses. So the more that I would try to be right, sin would condemn me even more. And this is the conundrum that the Apostle Paul is saying. He says, when I would do good, evil is always present. It's not that this, 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 this nature, how we, a lot of people have been preaching like, oh, I want to do good, but I can't. It's because, you know, I got, no, no, no. It's because the, the nature of the law of Moses, because the old covenant was so inferior that it was almost like a glitch in the quote unquote system that God himself defined and he allowed because he needed it to be inferior so that the new covenant could come. But that's a whole other story. But he says this, he says that the more that you try to do right, he says, evil is always present. <laughs> Glory to God. Let, let's just read this because this is good and this is midweek and we might as well be dope. All right. Watch this. <laughs> Verse number nine. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came or when the statute came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. Verse 11, for sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. That through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Ooh. So it was, here's the point. Now, I don't want to get too far away from the main point, but this is so good of a doctrinal thing that I want you to see this. It's saying that sin under the old covenant is that it had an opportunity to increase its grip and its hold on you based upon your awareness and whew, glory to God, your knowledge of the law of God. And so the more you became aware, hallelujah, and the more you became knowledgeable about the things of God, the more sin would get a tighter and tighter grip on you and produce more and more death in you and its outcome in your life. Oh my God. And so here you are walking upright but yet even more bound in sin. Now you might not know it. It might not look like that because glory to God, because the law of Moses still gave outcomes. The law of Moses still gave divine. He said, listen, if you keep my commandments, you'll be blessed. Is that not what the word of God says? There were still positive outcomes when you obeyed the commandments of God. There was still success based on it. But on the spiritual side, you became more and more dead, more and more entrapped in sin, more and more utterly sinful. And it creates this loop. Oh, why are these people calling me right now? I need about 10,000 ladies from around. It creates this pattern where you can't escape it. <laughs> Which is why the Apostle Paul says, oh, wretched man, who shall set me free? from the body of this death. That's verse 24. But let me, let me finish reading verse 14. It says, for we know that the law of Moses is spiritual. He says, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage into sin. For that which I'm doing, I don't understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now no longer Am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me? For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not wish, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes 
to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God. That means I joyfully agree with it in the inner man. He says, but I see a different law of God. I'm sorry, I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And here he says this, which I love. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then on one hand, whoo, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. So, so the old covenant has this, it has this weird conniption, contra, uh, contradiction, is that the more I'm locked into God, the more sin becomes manifest in my life. And it becomes utterly sinful. And he says, I can't escape. He says, who's going to deliver me? Because when I would do good, evil's present. He says, I want to do good in my mind because I have the knowledge of God. But this knowledge creates in me also a, pre a, 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 a presence and a power of sin and death that becomes greater and greater with the more knowledge that I get. Now, mind you, this is the old covenant. That's why he says, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is a way out. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Watch this. Verse number one of chapter eight says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I like the King James version. It says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse two, for the law oh, of the spirit of life or the kingdom covenant or the new covenant. Watch this. In Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Oh my God, for what the law of Moses couldn't do, weak as it was through the flesh, through your flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, my God. And so he says this, this loop that you had under the old covenant, where the more knowledge of God and the more knowledge of God's laws that you were able to receive, it would create in you an outcome of more sin and death in you. Glory to God. He says under this new thing, he says no more. Glory to God. Because what the law of Moses couldn't do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. <laughs> And, 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 and hallelujah. And, and, and so whew, you got to understand. Let's keep reading this because this is so good and it's so relevant. Glory to God. Verse five. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit for the mindset on the flesh is death. But the mind, glory to God, set on the spirit is life and death. Peace, meaning that the outcome that will occur in your life because of your spiritual existence, because you are born again, because you are now filled with the spirit and born by the spirit, it will create in you, watch this, an outcome of life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. Because it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Whew. How will you know you're in the flesh if you're not born again? If you're not born of the spirit? My God, you're still in the flesh. You know why? Come on, because it's the law of sin and death still reigns over your body. Glory to God. It still has access to you and it still will produce whatever it wants to produce in your life. You got to hear what I'm telling you. I'm, I'm going to bring, I'm going to wrap this together, but is we're going to have, we have a midweek service. Amen. Watch this. Whew. Verse nine. However, you are not in the flesh, but indeed the spirit. I'm sorry, but, in, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. Oh, glory to God. And, and if Christ is in you, 
though the body is dead because of sin. Yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Glory to God. Ooh Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I, I, I could go on this for, for, for a while, but the moral of the story is, is that when you get born again, you die. Glory to God. You die to the flesh. And the law of sin and death that was that you were once held bondage under and that you were captive to, it becomes released and eliminated off your life. And now it is you're living by the law of spirit of the spirit. Glory to God. And life and peace now becomes the outcome of your life. So let me let me let me let me. Try to reframe this. So the only way out of this wretched body of death that Apostle Paul was talking about where I want to do good, but evil is always present. He says the only way out of me wanting to do the law of God, I concur with it in my mind. But in my body, there is a different law that's waging war in my members, in my, my body. He says the only way out is that you have to be, watch this born again. And you have to be, specifically, he says, you have to be, how do I say this best? The Spirit of God has to dwell in you. And this happens, and when, the, and the only way for this to occur is that you have to die a spiritual death, which is why Jesus says you must be born again. Because when you die, what happens is you you die metaphor. I don't want to say metaphorically, but you die spiritually when you surrender to Christ, and He raises you up to newness of life, and His life now is flowing in you, and it's the Spirit of God that liberates you from the law of sin and death. And you have to hear exactly what I'm saying right now because this is so important. Because whereas once the outcome of sin of the law of sin in your life would only produce death now the outcome says that you're going to produce life and peace come on look at verse number six of romans eight it says for the mindset on the flesh is death but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace so i'm i'm, I'm slow walking this because we're getting ready to come to the punchline here so now now let's now let's put this all together under the old covenant or under the law of Moses, no matter how much you observed and you were knowledgeable about the law, which was holy and righteous and good, simultaneously it would produce utter sinfulness in you to the core of your being because glory to God because you were subjugated and captive to the law of sin and death boy this is good teaching and I need you to rock with me so no matter how much good and no matter how much knowledge remember we're talking about knowledge originally no matter how much knowledge of God and the things of God you had at the core of your being, it would produce even more death and utter sinfulness. So the things that you want to do, you find yourself not being able to do like you want to because there was a barrier, there is a limit because of sin and death over your life. Now that's under the old covenant, which is why Apostle Paul says, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Which is why he goes on to say, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Glory to God, who will not walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. So now when you get born again and you become uh, born again by the spirit of God and filled with the spirit, what happens is now, glory to God, there is a new law. There's no longer the, this catch-22 happening in your spirit. So now, the 
Hallelujah. Now, the more that you operate and you become knowledgeable about the things of God, about the kingdom covenant, the law of God, come on. The, what happens is it's no longer utter sinfulness that you receive, but Jesus says the enemy comes, but they're still killing, and destroy. But I come that you may have life and that more abundantly. It is utter life. It is utter righteousness. It is more and more life and more and more righteousness that becomes manifested in your body because of of, come on, under the new covenant where you are free from the law of sin and death, you are now only under the law of life and peace. So the more knowledge you get, glory to God, the more life is able to flow out of your body. I need you to hear what I'm telling you. So now, glory to God, under the new covenant, under the kingdom covenant, the more laws of God that you understand, the more of this knowledge of this testimony of Christ that you are able to receive and appropriate, the more life and that more abundantly will be released in you because no longer do you have this barrier of sin and death that is keeping you limited and keeping you restrained. Hallelujah. That makes it so that you can't do what the law of God says you can do. But now because you are under the law of spirit, glory to God and life in Christ Jesus. I hear apostle Paul saying, I can do all things. I need a church in here through Christ who strengthens me because now I've got life in me because now I'm under a new law of life. Hallelujah. By the spirit of God that makes whatever I become knowledgeable about, I'm able to walk in it and it's able to produce in me exactly what God intends for it to do. Come on, somebody shout, shout at me, let me know you with me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so the more knowledge, bless you, Jesus, the more knowledge you get in the new covenant, come on, under kingdom covenant, hallelujah, the more life you're able to experience. My God, because and these promises of God, come on, Jesus said in John chapter six, he said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The commandments that I give you, the statutes that I release to you, come on, this testimony that I'm bringing to you about the kingdom of God, they are spirit and they are life. Glory to God. And so when you receive it and you become knowledgeable about it, glory to God, it will produce in you exceeding life. Come on, it will produce in you an outcome and a performance of life and peace in your life that is unbridled, that has no limit, that has no barriers, no boundaries. Glory to God. It's the more deeper you go into this, come on, the more the life of God and the life of these promises will be released in your life completely. Come on, say amen to that. Glory to God. Boy, that's good, man. That's good. That's good. Ooh-wee. That's good, man. More life. Glory to God. And see, and so, so the point I was trying to make, I took a long time because I wanted to, you know, not just give you the good stuff, but I wanted to give you the understanding. Again, so under the old covenant, the more knowledge, we're talking about knowledge, the more knowledge of God's laws you got, the whole oh, glory to God, the more you became constrained to sin and death, according to what we read in Romans chapter 7, right? Under the new covenant, under kingdom covenant, glory to God, where you have been liberated and, sh and, and set free from the law of sin and death, the more of God's law or kingdom covenant that you become knowledgeable about, Watch this. The more of absolute life and abundant life becomes your portion. Ooh -wee. Ooh -wee. Come on. Bless you, Jesus. So now there becomes no absolute, for literally no more limitation on what is possible for you. No more limitation. Come on. On the scope of what God can release in your life. No more limitation based off of what's happening outside on the economy, on enemies, on the devil, on Satan, because now the law of God, the promises of God, the commandments of God are being able to be released and produced in my life without limit, without any barriers. 
Whew. This is why I'm telling you, you can be, you can be prosperous on purpose. This is why I'm telling you, you can be healed on purpose intentionally. Glory to God, because Jesus comes, come on, and liberates you off of the barriers and the shackles that will say, oh, this is God's plan, but you can only have so much. He says, no, now under the new covenant, under the kingdom of God, Jesus says that you can have whatever God says without limitation. Boy, boy, my God, you got to say amen to that glory to God, because what God is trying to let us see tonight is that we have an ability based on our, uh, on our capacity for knowledge, come on, to have absolute life, life and that more abundantly in every area of our world, of your existence. I'm telling you, there is no part of you that God says shouldn't be affected by life. Now, the devil has no right. The devil has no ability. He has has no longer any more jurisdiction over the blood washed, born again, spirit filled believer to limit your life, to keep you down and to oppress you by death and sin. Because if any man, I need the healthy ghost. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. And watch what he says. New things are coming. Better things are coming. Greater things are coming. Life is coming into your world. And so this is why you need knowledge because now when you get more knowledge of kingdom covenant, it will open you up to a realm of unlimited opportunity. You, let me just cabbage patch on that real quick. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul <laughs> and all that's within me. My God, it will unleash complete and total life in your life. I'm talking about life that Galatians chapter six talks about. It says, if you sow to the spirit, says, God, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. For whatever you sow to the flesh, you will from the flesh reap corruption. But watch this. But when you sow to the spirit or to the spiritual things or to the kingdom system, come on, you will reap life everlasting. I need you to shout life wherever you are. Oh my God, come on, because now the knowledge of God that is in me, the knowledge of God that I'm aware that I'm able to appropriate and that I'm able to make mine will create the platform and the foundation for life, Whew. which doesn't mean living. It literally means, come on, the flow of God. It literally means the flow of the spirit, the ability to exist and to function however God demands and however God deems you to function. Woo! Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Come on, shout life. Glory to God. And so the only thing missing is one of two things. One, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I don't even care. Hallelujah. You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost because it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost that, oh my God, come on, that will allow you to experience the fullness of life. And we not going to be deceived by the devil or by modern Christianity. You need the Holy Ghost because the baptism of the Holy Ghost is what's going to allow you to walk in and to receive the delivery of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, because it is the Holy Spirit, my God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost that gives you connection and your direct link to heaven and the realities of God. And so when you, Jesus said, come on, he says, when you have this spirit, if you're born of the spirit, rather Paul says, he says this, is that, 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 let me, let me not, let me not mess it up. Thank you, Lord. It says this, watch this, however, you are not in the flesh. But in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Come on. -wee. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive <laughs> because of righteousness. I need you to hear what I'm telling you tonight. My God. So either one, it is an absence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which gives you the indwelling of the spirit of God. Or two, it is an it is an absence of knowledge. 
Again, my people perish because of the lack of knowledge. Whew. Watch this. And both of them are free. Come on. The Holy Ghost is a promise that God gives to the church. Jesus said, if you believe on me, as the scriptures say, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Come on. We got to understand that the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the indwelling of the spirit of God is a promise that is available for every believer by faith. It is the gift of God. Come on. Come on. And if you are born again, believer, come on. If you say I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, come on. And if you have surrendered your life, come on. It is a promise. It is a gift that is not only just for you, but it is necessary for your life. My God. Hallelujah. We got a few more weeks before Pentecost, but I thought I'd just throw that in right now. Hallelujah. You need the Holy Ghost. Bless the Lord. But here's the part. Bless God. Come on. Come on. And he gives it to all who are willing and who ask. Jesus says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door shall be open. He says, if your earthly fathers, come on, being evil, know how to give good gifts. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, so, so family. So, so then if it's not, if, if glory to God. So if we are sufficiently indwelled by the Holy Ghost, then it becomes knowledge. How much time? Oh, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. I took way too long. Man, I'm out of time. It becomes knowledge. Here's the point, man, the Lord knows what he's doing. And I'm sorry if I violated God. <laughs> Is that in the new covenant, the more knowledge you get, and I'm not, see, here's the difference. Ooh-wee, glory to God. Come on, say, I gotta meditate. Yes, Lord, bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I have to meditate. Come on, shout, I have to meditate. I have to meditate. I have to meditate. Here's why, here's why. Because it's not, we're not just talking about, can you quote a scripture? Ooh, come on. Jesus says, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Meaning that his words have what in them? Spirit and what else? Life. That his words, the words of Christ, the words of the kingdom of God have in for you, watch this, have life in them. So packed in the scriptures, Jesus said this. He says, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, but they speak of me. See, the scriptures, glory to God, whew, under the filter of Christ, have immeasurable life for you. Mm -mm. This is the difference between the, the quote-unquote traditional Jew who follows Judaism versus the believer. Because no matter how much they read the word of God, and no matter how much they study the scriptures, they are more and more bound by sin and death, according to what we read in Romans chapter 7. And it can only produce a limit. They might get some natural outcomes, but 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 at the at the the, the Considering everything, there's a limit to what's possible for them, both naturally and especially spiritually. They're utterly dead in sin. Utterly dead in sin. Whereas under the new covenant, we could, oh my God, we can read the same scripture and we can have the same scriptures and the same promise. But under the filter and under in the face of Christ, <coughs> in the light of Christ, these scriptures now have atomic nuclear level type life that we can walk in because we don't have the limitation of sin and death they do we don't because christ has set us free from the law of sin and death are you with me and so jesus says glory to god the words i speak to you they are spirit and they are life these words of christ 
have unimaginable, uncontainable life in it for you. But you have to get them deep into your spirit. My God, come on. They have to get deep into your spirit and in your heart. Because if they don't, the life cannot be acquired. Now, here's the part. Jesus tells us this, that following him is akin to or similar to the narrow way, the narrow path. That leads to what? Life. And he said, broad is the gate that leads to destruction. So this means that the pathway to obtaining and to receiving this life is not necessarily naturally easy. It's hidden. It's somewhat complicated, like a lot of y'all's relationship statuses. <laughs> oh my God, not, not, not because God is trying to hide it from you, but, but because there is a principle of seeking after God, that, that God is smart enough to know that, that listen, anybody can come after me, but, but he says, blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness because they shall be filled. God is so much smarter beyond us. He says, if you're going to really follow me, if you're really going to seek after me, I need your heart. I, I need you to be committed to this thing. I, this can't just be a Sunday morning thing that you do where you show up, you shout, you say, man, and you look the part. And then the rest of your life, you live your own way. He says, I need you to diligently seek after me. I, I, I need, I, I'm looking for those, God says, who, whose hearts are mine completely and, 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 and who will chase after me and, and put their life on my words. That's what God wants. That's what God is looking for. And so the pathway to this life, Jesus said, few there be who find it. Not because he doesn't want you to, but because he's saying, okay, show me. Whew, how great a salvation we have. My God. That is not for the faint of heart, but it's those who will put everything on it, who will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See, this is what is going to prove who's really seeking it or not. Because we can all quote the verses. We can all put the social media statuses and the posts on Instagram. We can all do that. We can all tweet on Twitter a verse. But 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 whose life? is going to reflect diligence. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and watch this, and believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. David says, daily I will seek thee. Early in the morning I'll seek thee. He says, I'm like a fawn who is thirsty for you. I thirst for you, God. I thirst for you. I hunger. I need you. Glory to God. And when you have this level of focus and diligence on the word of God, that is the only way you can extract life from it, which is why we can be in a church where we all hear the exact same word, hear the exact same promises of God, but all get individual different results. It's not because God is a respecter of persons. God is a respecter of diligence. This is not communism or socialism where everybody gets it. It's, it's based off of, come on, according to your faith. I pray that you get a hunger for God. Watch this. And, and, and the way that you can get this into your spirit, these words, and extract the life is through meditation. Two verses or two passages. Psalm chapter one, verse number one. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, what is it? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates, how often? Day and night. 
in the law of God, he meditates under kingdom covenant. He meditates day and night. He meditates because why? Because I'm extracting the life out of this. I, I got to get the life out of these promises, out of these statutes, or otherwise is no point. So the way to do that is to meditate on it. How often? Day and night. Scripture says that you'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever you do, you'll prosper. How many want that? How many want that? See, the problem is, is that we want it, but where's our diligence? Come on. And I'm not saying this in like a, oh, pastor, always trying to play us. Like, no, I'm trying to help us because modern Christianity in America has got us so freaking messed up where we think we can just be anything, do anything, have no diligence after God, not meditate on this stuff. And it's just supposed to be like, you know what? Magic hocus pocus. And that's not the case. And that's why many believers are, are, what's what I'm looking for, are disgruntled and their faith is, is kind of tainted because they, they, they were told, you know, turn around three times and touch three people and, and every blessing of God is coming to your house by the time you wake up. No, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Absolutely not. But when you meditate on it, no, 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 but no, 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 that was a liar. This is what I'm telling you. The promises of God in Christ are both yes and amen. So don't know. Listen, it's coming to your life. It's going to happen for you. Whatever God has spoken in this book is for you. Whatever is according to his will and kingdom covenant, it is for you. Hear what I'm telling you, though. Yes, it's for you. But you got to meditate on these things. And meditation allows you to extract the light out of these verses. I got to stop. Y'all not going to come back on Sunday if I keep going. Hallelujah. Other one, Joshua chapter 1. Come on, you know this. We've been touching on it. Let's do this. Verse number... Six and nine, God tells my, God tells my, uh, Joshua, be strong and courageous for you shall give this people the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous and very, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law of Moses, my servant commanded, which my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right, to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. Here's what he says. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. It appears there is a principle here that if I meditate on it day and night, what's going to happen is so that I'll be careful according to do according to all that is written in it, then I will make my way prosperous and then I will have success. So kingdom success will come and the ability to extract and to receive the full promises of God based on his covenant come on my ability, one, to know it, and then two, to be able to extract the light out of it. By meditation. Yes, Lord. Day and night. He says it should not depart out of your mouth. This means that I got to be speaking it. I've got to be imagining it. Day and night. I've got to be thinking it. Speaking it and thinking it. Day and night. Come on, church. I'm trying to get you paid tonight. I'm trying to get you healed. You hear what I'm telling you? I'm not trying to play with you. I don't have time to play with you. You've been played with for too long. My modern Christianity has messed you up. But now we are being instructed and we are receiving the blueprint and the keys to actually finally be the church, the holy nation and the people of God. No shade to nobody. But I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this, that we now have no excuse. You have no excuse. Oh my God, or why are you still going to be broke and poor and stuck on government entitlements? You have no excuse. You have no excuse. Come on, why are you going to still be stuck not walking in purpose? You have no excuse. Why you say, well, I don't think God want to heal me. No, we, I'm telling you what the word says. 
Come on, shout, I'm coming out. Glory to God. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. God is increasing you. God is going to enlarge you. Come on, because you are going to one, you know. I have knowledge. And now under the kingdom covenant, it will produce an unlimited amount of life. And number two, I'm going to meditate on it so I can get the light out of it so it can birth and produce in me. Come on, some 30, some 60, 100 fold. Come on, let's give God a big shout of praise wherever you are. Come on, lift your hands, tell him thank you for this word tonight. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for enlightening. Thank you for understanding. Come on, thank you for releasing and speaking tonight. Lord, we ask tonight that as we are gathered and as we are meditating and as we are digesting and processing this word, may it not just be empty words, but may it be life to us. May it be building points, building blocks, come on, to what you have for us and what you've ordained for us to experience in this day and age. Father, we pray that you would, right now, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke doubt and fear. We rebuke skepticism and cynicism that is planted by the devil. And we declare that all that God has spoken, we will do. All that God has spoken, we will see. Father, we pray right now, come on, that you would just release a fresh feeling of the Holy Ghost even right now as our hearts are desirous. Come on, as our hearts are longing to see your promises experienced and filled in our life. We pray right now that the Holy Ghost would fall fresh on us as on the day of Pentecost as you did at Cornelius' house, as you did in Acts chapter 19, as you did with the Apostle Paul, God, we pray that it would fall fresh in the mighty name of Jesus and that we would be able to take this knowledge, glory to God, and receive knowledge, divine, supernatural knowledge by the Holy Ghost so that we can meditate and we can do our part day and night to speak it and to think it and allow it to produce life and that more abundantly. Father, we thank you right now. Come on. I thank you right now that your spirit is falling even right now. We bless you, Father. We thank you right now. Come on. And even right now that healing is falling even right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor, God. We thank you, my God, that we are limited. We are unshackled to walk in and to experience the boundless promises of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you praise and honor forever, forever and ever. Come on, shout amen. Hallelujah. If you receive it tonight, glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. The Lord loves us. Real quick, just in case if you came on late, you're more than welcome to still give and to sow if you want to. If you didn't get a chance to get your offering in tonight, you're able to do that. Amen. And to receive what God has for you in Jesus' mind. Listen, I'm going to tell you this. Like, see, it's the same thing with giving because it's it's life in it. These principles are life in it. But if if it's not light in you, then you can do something, but you won't get the life that's supposed to happen. Hallelujah, because you, you're just doing something. But I pray we don't just act, but we have light and life inspired actions in Jesus mighty name. Hallelujah. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're not born again, none of this means anything to you. You need to be born again. You need to know Jesus. You need to be able to be loosed from the law of sin and death and entered into the law of life and peace. Listen, that only happens by you being born again by you surrendering your life to Jesus, by you becoming a child of God. Jesus says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right or the power to become children of God, to as many as believe on his name. And so I want to tell you this tonight, that listen, you have a wonderful opportunity for God to begin to turn everything around in your life, for God to begin to remove migraines and for God to remove ulcers and to change things that are going negatively in your life. Listen, let me tell you something. There's an adversary. The devil don't just attack believers. He attacks unbelievers too. <laughs> he hates humanity. Glory to God. And he wants to destroy everybody. And the difference is, is that Jesus comes to save you. He comes to pluck you out of the devil's custody, out of his ability to keep you down. And he wants to give you this abundant life that not only will change your life, but enter you into a real life-giving, eternal relationship with God my God, that's better than anything you could imagine. Listen, that's you today. You say, I need Jesus in my life. I'm not born again. I need to be born again. I want to make sure that when I die, that I will go to heaven and be with God. I want to make sure that even while I live, I have a real relationship with God that can't be broken, that can't be 
challenged or tainted. I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. I want you just to lift your right hand to the God to, to, to heaven and say, Father, I'm a sinner. I come to you tonight needing you, asking you to save me, believing your word where you said, if I would confess Jesus as Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. Lord, I need you. I need Jesus. I surrender my life to you. Everything, my past, my present and my future, the good and the bad. I surrender it all. Father, I received Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. I believe that he died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you raised him from the grave. Lord, I believe and I confess today that Jesus is my Lord. He's my sovereign. He is my leader from this day forward, from this moment forward. I am his. I lay my life down. And I receive the life that's in Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, let me tell you, family, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it from your heart, listen, you are now born again. You what we call a new believer. And I'm so grateful. Let me be the first to congratulate you and tell you welcome into the kingdom of God, to the family of God. But listen, it don't stop there. You got to get you a, a good Bible believing church. Amen. There's a few more things that you want to do. You need to get baptized. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost, all that stuff. But it's easy. It's free. And it's for you. Amen. So we want to help you do that. What I want you to do is I want you to put in the comments, hashtag Jesus or inbox us on whatever platform you're watching. Send us a direct message. Put hashtag Jesus and your contact information and we'll get in touch with you and we'll help walk you through this so that you can receive the fullness of everything God has for you. Man, I'm telling you, your life is never going to be the same. Welcome to the family of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Listen, number two, if listen, if you're watching this today and you don't have a church home, you don't have a pastor for real. I'm not talking about like some imaginary TV pastor or internet pastor. I'm talking about a real pastor, a real church where like they said in cheers, where somebody knows your name. <laughs> Amen. Listen, I want to invite you to come on and be a part of our family here at Next Level Church here in New York City. Whether you're based in New York City or anywhere, listen, I'm telling you this right now. I want to be your pastor and I believe that God has put you in our pathway in this moment today so that you could actually get joined into a kingdom family. Amen. So where you can experience and receive what you need to grow. Listen, you can't do the kingdom of God. You can't do relationship with God without church. I don't care what anybody's telling you. There's no way, there's no pattern in scripture where you can do it alone by yourself. You need the church. You can't beat the system that God set up. You can try, but you'll go crazy. You'll miss out what God has for it, on what God has for you. And we don't want that. Amen. So listen, if that's you today, if you don't have a church home, maybe you say, maybe God is calling you here. You say, Lord, this is where I need to be. I need to be under this word. Amen. I need to be with these crazy folks. Amen. Listen, we're receiving you today. I want you to put in the comments, hashtag church, or send us a direct message on whatever platform you're watching, hashtag church. Amen. And leave, leave us your contact information so we can be in touch with you and we can show you what it means, what, it, what a Next Level Church member looks like. And I want to welcome you right now by faith because you're making that decision. You saying, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm getting up. I'm joining this church. You're doing it tonight. Amen. I want to encourage you. I want to celebrate you. Welcome to our family. Amen. And we're glad to have you in Jesus mighty name. Well, that's all I got tonight, family. Come on. Wherever you are, if you can stand up, stand up. Let's lift our hands to God and say, Father, we thank you tonight. We bless you. We glorify you. Thank you for an encounter with your word. Thank you for releasing strength tonight. Thank you for releasing wisdom. And I bless you. I pray that the peace of God be your portion today. I pray that joy fills your life for the rest of the week. And I pray, glory to God, that you are able to experience and walk in the fullness of seed time and unlimited opportunity. In Jesus' mighty name, peace and blessings, family. I love you. We'll see you Sunday, 10 a.m. Bring somebody, invite somebody, share somebody. It's getting gooder and gooder here at Next Level Church. I love you. Have a great night. Peace.